Hello everybody. In this video we're going to continue looking at UV unwrapping. In my previous video I showed you how you could create a texture from something like this playing card and apply it to a polygon plane in Maya. You'll remember that I created a texture of the card simply using the camera on my phone. Applying the texture required minimum UV work. Let's take a look at a more complicated example. For instance, what if I wanted to apply a texture to a box, like this box of cards? While the card consisted of a single plane, this box has six sides. To begin looking at this problem, let's look at a very simple example. For this very simple example, we'll be making a game die. And this is the texture that we'll be applying. To create the die, I'm going to start with a cube. And I'll create my material by going to the hypershade. I'll be using a blend for this because a die, a game die, typically has some shine or specularity to it. I'm going to rename my material. And in the color channel for the material, I will go to File and Apply My Texture. And now that I've created my material with its color texture, I will apply it to the cube and I'll press 6 on my keyboard so that I can see it in my viewport. That was actually quite simple, wasn't it? It applied without any problems whatsoever. To understand why, let's open up the UV editor. With my mesh selected, in the UV editor, I can see the texture which, which has been applied, as well as the UVs for the object itself. I'm going to click on the display image toggle so that you can see the UVs better. This will hide my texture. And what you'll notice is that the UVs line up perfectly with my texture. That is because I created the texture specifically for these UVs. Not only can I turn on and off the texture in the UV editor, but I can also click here to dim the image so that I can see my UVs better while still seeing the texture. You'll remember in my previous video that I talked about the different components on a polygon object. In the viewport, I can select vertices, and in the viewport, I can move those vertices around in 3D space. I can also select edges and move those around in 3D space, as well as faces. You'll also remember that I showed you a fourth type of component called UVs. UVs can only be moved in 2D space they can only be moved in the UV editor. And as I move the UVs around in the UV editor, you can see that the texture swims through the mesh in my perspective view. Notice that I can also select these different component types in the UV toolkit. I can select vertices, edges, and faces in the UV editor. However, if I move them in the UV editor, I'm actually not moving those components. I'm actually moving the UVs. I can also select shells. Shells can be found here in the UV toolkit. A shell is simply a continuous selection 
of UVs. The work that we do in the UV editor is UV unwrapping and UV mapping because it refers to the way that a 2D texture wraps around a three-dimensional form. Before moving on to the next example, let's do a couple things to make this game die look a little bit better. As you can see right now, the edges are quite hard-edged. So perhaps it'll look better if we try applying a bevel. Up to this point, we've primarily been looking at image textures used for the color channel of our materials. The image that we're looking at now is my color texture. I've created a second texture, however. As you can see, it looks very similar to the one I'm using for the color texture, but we'll try doing some different things with this texture. I'm going to return to my hypershade and select the material. And I will open up its properties in the attribute editor. Let's see how we can use images in some of the other channels of our materials. In this case, the transparency. Applying a file as a texture for one of these other channels is identical to applying it to the color channel. And if I apply this texture, you'll see that now the holes in the game die are transparent. We can see through them. I'm going to return to my material and I'm going to break the transparency connection. I'm going to get rid of the transparency. And I can do this by right-clicking on the word transparency and selecting break connection. Another property that we can look at for our materials is called bump mapping. I'll click on its checkerboard, select file, And then I'll click on the black arrow to the right of the bump value field. Now, clicking on the folder to the right of image name, I will select my dice bump map. Notice that the bump map gives the illusion that there's more modeling on this polygon object than there actually is. It makes it look like these divots actually go into the dice form. To better understand your materials, you can go to the hypershade, select the material, and then click on this button here. This is the input-output connections button. This will show me the network of nodes that creates my material. I'm going to select the Bump 2D node because I actually want to adjust its value. I will be adjusting the Bump Depth. By inputting a smaller number, this will make the divots in this die look a little more subtle. To better understand what makes Bump Map special, I'm going to place a light in my scene. Remember to press 7 on your keyboard to enable lights in your viewport. As I adjust the light in the scene, notice how the divots in my game die react appropriately to the change in the lighting. I've created a plane so that I have a surface to cast a shadow on. I'll change my render to Maya Software. After working with the scene a little bit longer, this is what I have. 
and here's my render. Notice these areas around the divots. They really do look like they have more modeling than there actually is. We'll now look at a more complicated scenario. I've created this texture to be used for a Rubik's Cube. However, unlike the game die example, this texture will not work with a cube's default UVs. In addition to the color map, I've also created a bump map. Bump maps are typically black, white, and gray values. Darker values tend to recede or appear indented. Brighter values appear to protrude or come out. As with the game die example that we looked at previously, I will start these, this Rubik's Cube also with a polygon primitive cube. I will go to my hypershade and I will create another blend. And selecting my material, I'll go to the attribute editor, rename my material. And apply the color texture to the color field of the material. I'll return to my hypershade and middle mouse drag the material onto the geometry. And I'll press 6 on my keyboard so that I can see the texture applied. Notice that this texture is not mapped properly onto the cube. To fix that, I will go to my UV editor. And we'll take a look at why this texture doesn't map properly onto the cube. Notice that my texture is mapped entirely differently than my UVs. Again, these are the default UVs uh, that come standard with a polygon primitive cube. I'm selecting faces, but remember that what I'm actually moving are UVs in the UV editor. I'm going to start moving these different faces into place, but notice that I cannot do this effectively because they're connected to one another. To solve this problem, I'm going to select these interior edges. And with these edges selected, I will go to my UV toolkit and I will click on the Cut button, which is under the Cut and Sew section. Notice that I can now select these different faces, or rather UV shells, and move them into place. I will now go through the process in the UV editor of adjusting and moving the UVs to conform to my texture. Notice as I adjust them in the UV editor that you can actually see the texture being updated in the perspective viewport as well. And finally, after a few moments of adjusting the UVs in the UV editor, I have completed the UV unmapping for my Rubik's Cube. And, like the game die example from earlier, let's go to the Rubik's Cube material and apply a bump map to it as well. We'll be applying the bump map to the bump mapping part of the material. Remember that the image is applied to the bump value field. And here is my Rubik's Cube with the bump map assigned to it. If you need to make further adjustments, you can always select your material in the hypershade and then click on the up and downstream connections or input-output connections. And notice how the bump map again gives it the illusion of having more modeling than there actually is. If I press 5 on my keyboard, 
putting it in shaded mode, you'll see that no actual change has happened to the 3D model itself. So that you can get a better idea of what the bump map is actually doing, I'm going to temporarily break the connection with the color map. And here's my Rubik's Cube with no color map and only a bump map applied. While I haven't actually done it for this example, remember that perhaps applying a bevel to this Rubik's Cube could also make the model look a little better. I hope you've enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.